it's really an honor to be here today. I mean, this has been such an incredible conference. And, I mean, to me it's especially exciting that the conference is here at Bow High School. As Sunday said, I am a graduate of this school, and uh, it's, it's something I don't like to admit, that, but 10 years ago, I sat not too far from this room for my own high school graduation. Now, 10 years is a long time. I mean, it's flown by, but I still feel a little embarrassed saying um, In those 10 years, a lot of things have happened. I come from a big family, and we have had 12 additional graduations since my high school graduation, ranging from high school all the way up to a PhD. That's a picture of my dad and me at my college graduation. And when you attend so many of these graduations, you become something of an expert on the graduation speech. <laughs> and to me, this is the most important part of graduation. And these speeches run the gamut. Some are long, some are short, some are funny, some are meaningful. But they all try to be inspirational. This is a word cloud of a recent graduation speech. It's an excellent speech. And you see it's got these positive, empowering words like yes, life, experience. Now there's a word from this speech, or a word that's not in this speech, it's conspicuously absent. And that word is together. Most graduation speeches kind of follow this format. They call on students to do great things, but they treat this as an individual enterprise. You know, they recognize that the school community has had an effect, but now that it's time to sort of spread the wings and fly, they think that you do this alone. And I think our view of history kind of conforms to this narrative. Whenever we think of greatness, we tend to think of individuals. I mean, even if we have a mass movement, we identify a leader who's sort of the driving force and we associate all the positive attributes with that individual. Well, I don't think that greatness is necessarily a single person experience. I think that we can do great things in communities. I think we can do great things together. We may not often think of communities as sort of the nucleus of greatness. You might ask, well, why is that? Why do we associate this with individuals? Well, I don't think that there's some kind of conspiracy in this that's emphasizing the accomplishments of individuals over communities. I, I actually think it's very hard for communities to be great together. I mean, it's hard for individuals. But as hard as it is for individuals, it becomes way more complicated when it's not one person, but a whole group of people. And if we were to break inspiration down into a process, we might think that there are two stages. An individual first becomes passionate about something, becomes inspired by something. Um, this inspiration then motivates the individual to do something remarkable, to inspire others. Now, we can call these two steps transformation and engagement. And we see this in famous figures and historical figures all the time. I mean, I think a good example, kind of a silly example, is Isaac Newton. You know, he, if we believe the legend, he saw an apple falling from a tree, and that gave him deep insight into the way the world worked and helped him transform the world. Now, ideally, this process would create something of a virtuous cycle, where one person inspires another, who inspires another, and so on and so forth. Now, that may be why you're here today. You're thinking, maybe I can find a spark of inspiration that will help me do something great. But what happens when it's no longer the individual? What happens when it's no longer me, but we? Well, a community is more than just a collection of individuals. It has its own dynamic. And we need to understand that dynamic if we're going to help our communities be great together. So I'd like to look at these two steps and how they work for communities, starting with transformation. So we might think, well, clearly this would be difficult for people to experience together. I mean, we view transformation as a very individual process. You know, take the example of Nelson Mandela. He spent 27 years in prison for fighting apartheid. And this could have left him filled with hatred, filled with bitterness and resentment. But he transformed. When he walked out of that prison, he was dedicated to a new way of ending the deep inequalities of apartheid. Well, that's almost like a conversion experience. How can we ever expect a group of people to experience the same thing? I mean, think about it. In any community, there are going to be those folks who are motivated, who are believers, who are energetic. But there are going to be a lot of people who are kind of asking themselves, hey, you know, what time is lunch? <laughs> I mean, You've probably seen this in your own communities. If I were to ask the students here today, what do you think of Bow High School? I'm sure some of you would have an association like this. 
Care Bears hunting for Easter eggs. Uh, but many of you would probably think of something like a prison. So nobody, not even the most persuasive person in the world, can get everyone to feel passionate about the same thing. But that's not the goal. The goal isn't to transform everyone individually. It's to transform the community. And like I said, a community is more than just the individuals that make it up. Now, for much of human history, that wasn't true. Our communities were organized on very obvious networks. Family, ethnicity, religion. You know, these days, many of our communities, and especially communities here in the United States, have no connection to these obvious networks. Not everyone in your town is related to you, and they are unlikely to not share, their, they probably don't share the same religion either. But in the absence of these more obvious networks, What's connecting us? Imagination. A historian named Benedict Anderson wrote a, did a study on nationalism, and he used the term imagined communities to describe modern political entities. Now, imagine is very different from imaginary. We're not talking about fanciful, non-existent entities. Rather, these are entities that have meaning because we give them meaning. Take the example of borders. There's nothing that says that people on one side of an invisible line are different from people on the other side of that line. Borders often change without any input from the people most affected by that change. And yet, whether through treaty, war, or purchase, over time, borders can take on powerful meaning for defining who we are as a community. Well, just as we use our imaginations to set the geographical definitions of our community, we use our imaginations to set the moral and ethical definitions of our community to set the vision of what our community is. You know, we look to the past to see where we've come from. We look to the future to see where we can go. But then we bridge the two in the present. And each community is an unfinished story. And we are its storytellers. Like any new storyteller, we can't ignore what has come before. But that doesn't mean that a story won't have twists and turns. And if our vision, like a good story, is captivating, it will ignite the imagination of people living in that community. If we transform a community, the effect will flow down to its individual members, even if they are initially hostile or resistant to the values in that vision. You know, this happened during the Civil War. At the outset, most Union soldiers were not fighting to free the slaves. You know, they fought to preserve the Union. Maybe they wanted an adventure, or they did it out of economic necessity. But even if their individual attitudes were apathetic or even antagonistic towards African Americans, the story of America was in the midst of a profound chapter, one that would see its founding ideals extended to all citizens regardless of race. And as this narrative gained momentum, it caught up individuals. Pretty soon, Union soldiers were writing home, talking about the great mission that they were on to emancipate the slaves. Now, these people were initially hostile to the idea. In fact, many of them came from regions just as racist as anywhere in the South. But because the story of America was changing and it caught their imagination, they changed too. Now this process can take a long time. But so what? I mean, it takes a long time to turn a tanker ship when it's going full speed. And that's no reason not to do it. Besides, it has never been easier to have a role in shaping the vision of our community, to be a storyteller. You know, it used to be that there were very few people that could reach the entire community. Politicians, newspapers, public places of worship, and more recently, television. Well, those traditional storytellers still exist, but now they're jostling for space with things like social media, celebrity culture, and advanced technology. The geographical definitions of our community are changing in a globalized world. Well, in the same way, the values and the vision of our community is changing in the 21st century. And there's nothing stopping us from having a role in that. But even if we're successful in transforming our community values, we have to get the community engaged. And we have to get people off the couch and actually doing something. This is really, really difficult. I mean, it's hard for communities to do things that should be easy. I mean, let's say that you think that the atrium in Bow High School could use a ping pong table. You've done some research and you found a great table for $600. So you go to your classmates and you say, hey, listen, there are 600 students. If we each pay a dollar, we'll have the benefit of this table and it won't cost anyone too much money. 
Sounds like a great plan. So all of your classmates are in. But then one person says, you know what? I actually don't play that much ping pong. I just soon buy myself a candy bar. And another person says, well, I'm a senior. Why should I pay as much as a freshman if I only get to use this for one year? Another person says, I bet if I don't pay, someone will pay $2. I'll still get to use the table, and I won't have to give up any money. If enough people adopt this attitude, eventually the entire plan falls apart. The political scientists and economists call this the collective action problem. Whenever a group tries to do something together, individuals will have a strong incentive to act in their own self-interests as opposed to the common good. This explains why it's hard for communities to accomplish things, <laughs> even things that benefit the community. So you can imagine how difficult it would be for a community to do something that requires sacrifice. Well, we have to undo the collective action problem. We need to help individuals see the benefit in sticking together. Well, how do we do that? Changing the values of a, of a community is a good place to start, but it's not enough. The temptation to act in our own interest will always be strong. But we can't force people to stick together. I mean, there's certainly nothing inspirational about that. We need to encourage people. We need to covenant with people. Now, this is a word you might think of in a religious context, but really what it means is an exchange of promises. You see, there's a big difference between telling someone what to do and covenanting with that person to hold each other accountable for the values that you share. This isn't some sort of formal agreement. Rather, it's an unspoken but mutual trust that motivates us to be our best selves. Okay, so we need to motivate each other. Where do we begin? Well, you might think, first people come to mind, friends and family. I mean, they respect you. They listen to you. But you know, that's kind of the problem. They're easy to motivate. They might think like you. I mean, that's why you're such good friends. And what's more, if you want to get the entire community involved, you may find yourself stymied because your friends, well, they're friends with each other. The people that you need to motivate, the relationships that you need to develop, are those people that lie just beyond your friends and family. These are people who may not always think like you, who certainly know people that you don't, and who are crucial for spreading this idea of cooperative responsibility. You know, we need both kinds of people in our lives. We need close friends, we need casual acquaintances. With our close friends, we develop these relationships by sharing new experiences, by understanding each other. Sociologists call this type of activity bonding. But with our casual acquaintances, we may not have the time to share those experiences with everyone. Instead, we look for commonalities, and we expand our network. This type of social activity is called bridging. And it turns out that bridging is crucial for overcoming the collective action problem. You know, it's no surprise that we tend to conform to the actions of our close friends. But when we see a casual acquaintance do something extraordinary, it challenges our assumptions, and it may inspire us to follow suit. The more bridges we have for our community, the more likely that a small action can have an outsized effect. So what does this all look like in practice? I'd like to share a story that I think encapsulates some of these principles. In early October of 1943, the people of Denmark came together in an instant to protect their Jewish neighbors from a Nazi deportation order. First they hid the Jews, and then they transported them in fishing boats to Sweden and to safety. At the time, there were about 8,000 Jews living in Denmark, and almost all of them were saved, protected. This is an incredible story. It's all the more remarkable because if you look at every other country at that time, nobody did anything comparable. This was spontaneous. It was done by almost everyone in society. But it was totally uncoordinated. And so we might ask ourselves, well, how could Denmark be so great? How could they do something so remarkable? I don't think we actually know the true answer to that question. I wish we did. But I'd like to offer a few thoughts about why, may, why it might have been possible in Denmark. First of all, Denmark had the right values in place. You might think of Denmark as a country of rampaging Vikings. But in the 1800s, Denmark underwent a profound transformation in its values. It had suffered a series of military defeats, and it realized it could no longer be a world power. 
A Danish friend once put it to me this way. He said, when we learned we could no longer be big on the outside, we focused on being big on the inside. And this meant treating all citizens equally, regardless of religion. These values were important, but they weren't enough. The Danes learned about the deportation order less than 48 hours before it was to begin. And yet they were able to seamlessly warn the Jews and hide the Jews. Well, how did they do it? Well, they relied on their extended networks. They told anyone that they thought could have an impact. And not only did they talk, but they listened. When one neighbor said to another, this terrible thing is about to happen, they respected each other enough to take action as a result of that. People volunteered their homes, their churches. Hospitals began taking in fake patients with Christian names to hide them. And when the Germans went door to door to round up the Jews, they found empty homes. And when the Germans waited a few days, saying, eventually the, da the Danes will turn in their neighbors, that gave them enough space to successfully smuggle the Jews out of Denmark. Everything about this story is so incredible. But one of the most fascinating things to me is that the Danes didn't see anything remarkable about it. One pastor who led an underground organization spoke to the entire country when he said, these people were in mortal danger and we had no alternative. We had to do what we did. You know, when individuals do great things, we celebrate their lives. But as Denmark shows, the true sign of an inspirational community is that its members don't see anything remarkable about the great things that they do together. So now I'd like to leave you all with a modest request. When this conference is over, which according to the program is now, <laughs> I'd like you to do a couple of things. First, I'd like you to turn to the people sitting on either side of you, people sitting in front of you and behind you. I'd like you to ask those people a question. What did you think? What did you find funny? What was inspirational? What did you think was silly? I want you to start telling your story, sharing your vision about what this means. Now, it may not transform the community, but it will start a conversation. <laughs> and conversation is the beginning of community. The next thing I'd like you to do is, is to look inside of yourselves and ask, what am I going to do next? You see, the feelings that we have right now are only as meaningful as the actions that they produce. Now, those actions may be small. They certainly will often start small. But the more connections we have through our communities, the more likely those actions will have an incredible effect. You know, inspiration is not a single player game. We can be inspired and inspire others together. So all we have to do is go out there and do it. Thank you.